Good morning. Uh, the committee meets today to consider House Resolution 2146, the Debt Act, House Resolution 1974, Access to Congressionally Mandated Reports, House Resolution 2061, the Civil Service Recognition Act of 2011. <coughs> Activity Report of the Committee on Oversight. Okay. House Resolution 789. Okay. House Resolution uh, 789, a bill to designate a facility of the United States Post Office located at 20 Main Street in Little Ferry, New Jersey, as a Sergeant Matthew J. Fenton Post Office. Also, House Resolution 1843, a bill to designate a facility of the United States Postal Service located at 489 Army Street Drive in Guam as the John Bangal Linman or Bangal E. Mun uh, Gerber Post Office building. Also, House Resolution 1975, a bill to designate a facility of the United States Postal Service located at 7, or 281 East Colorado Boulevard in Pasadena, California, as the first Lieutenant Oliver Goodall Post Office building. House Resolution 2062, a bill to designate the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 45 Meeting House Lane in Sagamore Beach, Massachusetts, as the Matthew A. Puccino Post Office. House Resolution 2149, a bill to designate the facility of the United States Post Office at 4354 uh, Pahoa Avenue in Honolulu, Hawaii, as the Cecil L. Heffel Post Office Building. And the list goes on. House Resolution 2213, a bill to designate the facility of the United States Post Office, Postal Service located at 801 West East Port Street in Luca, Iuaka. You got to be kidding. Okay. I am sorry, the, the phonetics uh, pronunciation is a little questionable here. Mississippi as the Sergeant James A. Fall Post Office. And finally, House Resolution 2244, a bill to designate a facility of the United States Postal Service located at 67 Castle Street in Geneva, New York, as the Corporal Stephen Blaine Recone or, or no, Recone uh, Post Office. Pursuant to the Committee Rule 6, I discharge the Subcommittee on Federal Workforce and the Subcommittee on Technology Information Policy and Procurement Reform from consideration of House Resolution 1974, House Resolution or H.R. Uh, 2061, and H.R. 2146. The Committee will now consider H.R. 2146, the Data, the Data Act, and I recognize myself for an opening statement. The Data Act is the culmination of two years or more of bipartisan effort. In May of 2009, then Chairman Ed Towns and I introduced legislation that set up a consistent data standard for Federal financial information. That is the basis for this bill. The Committee has tracked <coughs> the success of the Recovery Board. The Data Act extends the Recovery Board uh, and expands and mandates and changes it essentially to standardize over the broad basis of the United States financial oversight. Particularly, the Data Act is to combine Federal agencies with information reported by grantees, contractors, onto a single platform. It will impose consistent data elements and reporting standards on spending information <clears throat> so that reports pertaining, diff or pertaining to different agencies and different programs will become compatible. It will be able it will apply sophisticated search capabilities to the Recovery Board pioneered uh, spending system, and it will allow both citizen watchdogs 
and investigators within the government to have access to a broad group of, of data sets previously not allowed. There is no question, today, we here in, on this dais, plus the Sunlight Foundation, the project on government oversight uh, campaign legisl or companion legislation has in, been introduced by Senator Mark Warner. I am pleased that the White House in, has indicated strong support that this is, in fact, a bipartisan from the start piece of legislation. I want to caution everyone, you will hear, as you always hear with transition, that this will require a great deal of cost and labor, that this will, in fact, cause various new spending. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Data Act streamlines the ability for government to have a single point and, more importantly, a single type of reporting so that if one day you are doing business with the Department of Agriculture and the next day you are responding to a grant uh, from Treasury or from uh, HHS, you are going to have the same basis. This will make software less expensive, more uniform, and provide for an easier way to communicate in to the Federal Government and for watchdogs and government officials to look deep into databases in order to find the kind of waste, fraud, and abuse that this committee so dearly needs in a large and bloated economy, uh, a large and bloated Federal bureaucracy. And with that, I recognize the gentleman from Maryland for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, protecting taxpayers' hard earned money from waste, fraud, and abuse is one of the most important issues we deal with on this committee. In 2009, Congress passed the Recovery Act to promote job creation, economic activity, and long-term growth. As part of the Recovery Act, we put in place some of the strongest transparency and accountability measures ever enacted. <clears throat> For example, we created the Recovery Accountability and Transparency Board, also known as the RAT Board, which has improved the government's ability to track Federal spending by leaps and bounds. We should just uh, take a moment to acknowledge this fact. Last week, the Chairman of the RAT Board, Earl Devaney, uh, testified that the Recovery Act has had historically low levels of waste, fraud and abuse. In his testimony, Mr. Devaney called this enhanced transparency the force multiplier that drives accountability. On June 13, President Obama signed an executive order that takes the model of the RAT Board and extends it across the Federal Government. The President's executive order establishes a new Government Accountability and Transparency Board, or the GATT Board. The purpose of the GATT Board is to provide strategic direction for enhancing transparency and eliminating waste, fraud and abuse in programs across the entire Federal Government. Today we will consider Chairman Issa's legislation, H.R. 2146, the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act. This bill also would establish a new board called the Federal Accountability and Spending Transparency Board, or the FAST Board. It would be authorized to set government-wide data standards and coordinated oversight of Federal funds to prevent waste, fraud and abuse. This is a good thing. I support all of these ideas, which are good ones, and I am encouraged that our committee is now taking action. It has been six months since the beginning of this Congress, and my position has not changed and has been consistent. Increasing transparency and open government should not be a partisan issue. So today I am happy to announce that I am endorsing Chairman Issa's bill. I do have some additional concerns, including the full-scale repeal of the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act, the seven-year sunset, and the unprecedented authorities granted to the new board, the financial burden on the State and local governments, and other issues. But for the purposes of today's markup, I support the bill in favor of moving it forward. I am also gratified that we were able to work together to insert into the bill some of the legislation I introduced in March, along with all of the Democratic members of the committee. <clears throat> in particular, the GAO Improvement Act has been included as part of the amendment in the nature of a substitute. I am also greatly encouraged that Chairman Issa has now agreed to allow the committee to consider two other pieces of legislation introduced by the Committee Democrats. One is the Presidential Records Act amendments, which would increase public access to Presidential records by establishing statutory procedures 
prior to FOIA releases. And the other is the Federal Advisory Committee Act amendments, which would require agencies to disclose more information about the advisory committees. And I want to thank the Chairman in the last Congress for working so hard on that particular, particular piece of legislation, and it would not have passed uh, off the floor uh, if it had not been for his efforts. I look forward to our committee passing both of these bills, uh, hopefully at our next markup. Mr. Chairman and I have always supported bipartisan efforts to bring greater transparency and accountability to the Federal Government. I understand that our staffs have been working together well on these efforts. So I also want to thank all of them for their hard work. And I hope we can uh, keep this up and move these bills forward. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and I, too, can uh, say that our staffs have renewed their effort and are doing very well together. With that, I would uh, uh, offer to hold the record open until the end of the day for any members to submit written statements uh, or extraneous material. We, are, we will now open the bill, H.R. 2146, for consideration. Without objection, H.R. 24. Uh, 46, 2146 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any t uh, point. The text has already been distributed and should be in each of your folders. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 2146, a bill to amend Title 31, United States Code, to require accountability and transparency in Federal spending and for other purposes. I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, Excuse me. I have an amendment at the desk in nature of a substitute. The amendment has been distributed. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and used as original text for the purpose of all other amendments. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize myself to explain the amendment. The amendment in the nature of a substitute applies a number of suggestions, including the bipartisan suggestion made through our committee staff, in order to improve the bill. As the ranking member said, there is no question that we can continue to progress both during this markup today and until final passage on improving this. I share with the uh, ranking member the concern that we want to make sure that this is a, uh, a, a piece of legislation that, in fact, in the long run makes it easier on States and, and local governments to do the reporting that in many cases they are already doing. Last week, uh, as a result of our, uh, our hearing and hearing from the Nevada uh, reporting officer who had both concerns and constructive suggestions on why they thought that the bill would help with that, we decided to make additional changes. Uh, in, in addition, this <coughs> excuse me, ensures that there is a notice and comment requirements of the Administrative Procedures Act and will apply important decisions of the new FAST board. The, the ranking member is correct. The FAST board will have vast uh, capability. But one of the things that has been lacking in the past is continuity of an organization dedicated to the purpose of data transparency. That will transcend, I hope all of us agree, administrations of both parties. Additionally, the, uh, the amendment clarifies uh, the need for sub, sub, sub guarantees and contractors. As we all know, often government contracts are large and are not easily broken down, and yet the real fruit that of waste or inefficiencies or just wanting to know on behalf of the American people occurs with subcontractors or even sub, subcontractors. I might particularly note that for a long time, this committee has wanted to know, along with the Judiciary Committee, about minority uh, participation in contracts. As we go through this system, it is important that we understand you cannot know what minority participation, minority and women participation is if you only know about the general contractor. The makeup of their subs is just as important. Additionally, it requires a majority vote for the FAST vote to use its testimony and its now uh, its enabled subpoena power. I think this is particularly important for a board that will last for a very long time and that we want to make sure maintains the highest standards of discretion when it comes to using authority envisioned in this bill. It also incorporates, as I said, Mr. Cummings' uh, proposals uh, as the ranking member on behalf of Democrats, uh, proposals to improve the, the Government Accountability Office. 
Does any, uh, does any other member wish to speak on the bill? Mr. Chairman. I recognize the ranking member for his statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment makes a number of technical and clarifying changes to the bill. These changes include language to ensure Inspector General independence, in addition to the issuance of a subpoena for testimony on a vote of the Board, narrow the authority of the Board to grant and reporting exemptions to classes or categories of recipients, and incorporate the Government Accountability Office improvement provisions of H.R. 1124, <coughs> a bill, uh, as you said, I introduced in March with the support of uh, every Democrat on the committee. Again, I want to thank the Chairman for working with the minority in a bipartisan manner on this amendment. I appreciate the Chairman's willingness to incorporate some of our suggestions into the bill. While I may have additional perfecting amendments, I urge all members to support this amendment. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Does any member have an amendment to offer? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, the clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2146 offered by Ms. Spear of California. Page 28, line 22, insert after Federal funds the following. To the extent practicable, the Board shall give high priority to auditing, investigating, or reviewing Federal funds awarded without the use of competitive procedures such as sole source contract. The gentlelady is recognized to explain her amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I hope this amendment uh, receives bipartisan support. As we all know, the Federal Government awards $535 billion in contracts each year. About a third of that money, $177 billion, is awarded to noncompetitively, non-bid or sole source contracts. In the contracting universe, there is no question that no-bid sole source contracts are the most ripe for waste, fraud and abuse. Given this, these contracts are the low-hanging fruit for rooting out waste, and this new agency should set its sights on these contracts first. My amendment would do just that by directing the Board to first focus auditing, investigating and reviewing on, on Federal funds awarded via no-bid or sole source contracts. Uh, I yield back. Uh, I recognize myself in support of the amendment. Uh, because the amendment sets it as a high priority and not first, and I just want to make sure I heard that correctly, uh, I can certainly support it. I believe that uh, we will have a number of amendments offered today that speak in terms of what the priorities are. And although often we do this in report language, I have no objections to uh, this be included in the base bill. And I yield back. Mr. I recognize the ranking member. Mr. Chairman, I just want to have a brief comment. I want to thank the gentlelady for her amendment. This is a, a very good amendment. The sole source contracts are awarded without the benefit of competition, which provides the valuable check of the marketplace in helping agencies determine the best price and value. While sole source contracts are sometimes necessary and appropriate, giving them a high priority for oversight is an excellent idea. I urge the members to support this amendment and yield back. The question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by the gentlelady from California. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Are there any further amendments? The, uh, I'm going to start with Mr. Connolly. He actually almost won the first round. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized to offer an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, Mr. Chairman, let me just say I, I Do you have an amendment at the desk? I do. I have an amendment at the desk. Amendment the clerk will designate the amendment. 074. 074. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2146 offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia, page 27, line 14, strike and, page 27, line 18, strike the period and insert, quotation, semicolon, and, page 27, insert after line 18 the following, for the Administrator for Federal Procurement Policy and the Director of the Federal Acquisition Institute. Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. I thank the Chair. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I'm going to support your legislation. I will confess to some, quer uh, some queasiness about the implementation. And I'm uh, very pleased that the Chairman has worked with the ranking member of the Democratic minority in trying to uh, make improvements to the bill. And I certainly pledge to work, continue to work with the Chairman and the ranking member uh, to further that cause, because I think there are some other issues we can between now and taking this bill to the floor, uh, it, it further perfect this 
this piece of legislation. My amendment is a fairly simple amendment, Mr. Chairman. It proposes that we add two members to the FAST Board, the Director of the Office of Federal Procurement Policy and the Director of the Federal Acquisition Institute. The purpose for doing this is to ensure that there is some contracting expertise on the Board. Uh, one of the subjects, certainly, this committee has dealt with um, extensively is the contracting subject. And, and I just want to make sure that there actually is contracting expertise, Federal contracting expertise on the Board looking at that particular set of issues and with that particular expertise. And the amendment is that simple. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. I recognize myself uh, to express concern but support. Uh, in the present form, I cannot uh, support it uh, partially because, quite frankly, I am concerned about designating specific individuals at this time. I do share with the gentleman the belief that uh, we need to make sure we have a board that includes representation from the contracting community. If the gentleman will withdraw his amendment, I will agree to work with him before it goes to the board, uh, floor to ensure that we find an amicable solution to uh, increasing the uh, participation by individuals who have that specific uh, background. Certainly, with your assurance, Mr. Chairman, I would be glad to do that. Does anyone else have an, uh, does anyone else have, without objection to order, does anyone else have an amendment to offer? The gentleman from uh, Illinois. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will I designate the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2146, offered by Mr. Quigley of Illinois. Page 29, after line 11, insert the following. 7, issuing a report in accordance with subsection D on the feasibility of collecting and publishing online tax expenditures data. I would ask unanimous consent to be considered as read and recognize the gentleman to ex explain his amendment. Without objections, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I applaud you for this. Uh, what I think is an innovative and much needed bill to improve oversight of Federal spending. Uh, the reforms outlined in this bill will streamline spending information, improve data quality, eliminate redundancies, and bring unprecedented transparency to Federal spending. Uh, my only addition to this bill is to encourage consideration of including tax expenditure data on the government spending website created by the bill. The Act will create a comprehensive website with information about every Federal dollar spent. However, missing from all this data are tax expenditures. While tax expenditures are not traditionally considered spending programs, they do function in a similar manner, similar, similar manner to spending in that a dollar handed out in a tax break increases the deficit just as a dollar handed out in a grant. Take, for example, Federal spending aimed at improving housing. What is the government's most expensive housing program? Spending on housing totals $26.4 billion, while the Department of Housing and Urban Development totals $49.3 billion. Yet we spend $221 billion on housing tax expenditures each year, an amount not included in the budget or subject to regular reviewing committee. There is clearly an oversight problem with tax expenditures. As we see in the case of housing, they dwarf our on-budget counterparts, but they aren't scrutinized in the same way as other programs. Tax expenditures total over $1 trillion per year, or the same amount spent annually on discretionary spending. We can debate over the utility of certain tax expenditures, but what I am arguing for here is simply more transparency of these, uh, ex of these costs. Uh, so basically, what we are asking the Board to report what data should be available in order to better evaluate these expenditures. The, the amendment simply asks the new FAST Board to report on the feasibility of collecting and posting tax expenditure data. My equipment also requires the Board to report on any changes to the law needed to make this data publicly available. I hope my colleagues will join me in calling for greater oversight of these expenditures and support the common sense amendment requiring the new FAST Board to examine the viability of making this important information more open and transparent. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. Uh, if the gentleman, uh, and we have conferred with your staff, would agree, starting with line 10, to have this amendment read, uh, description of processes that could be put in place to collect tax expenditure information, uh, then we could support it, uh, the change being the difference between making a final decision 
and, in fact, recognizing that that has to come back to Congress. But I believe the amendment is extremely good. I, I only had one, that one, our staffs mutually only had that one concern. Very good. Mr. Chairman, we have no objection to that. Okay. Answers. So uh, without objection, that language, which is going to be placed before the clerk, will be uh, amended in the gentleman's amendment. Does anyone else wish to comment on the, uh, the ranking member is recognized for the, on this amendment? First of all, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, working with Mr. Quigley to try to uh, get this amendment in. I want to thank Mr. Quigley for an excellent amendment. Uh, as I have already said here today, the issue of Federal spending transparency and accountability is one of the most important issues this committee deals with. The Chairman reads a statement at the uh, start of every committee hearing that talks about the importance of protecting taxpayer dollars. That statement also says this, our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. I wholeheartedly agree. Taxpayers do have a right to know uh, how their hard-earned tax dollars are spent, and what tax dollars are getting from uh, what taxpayers are getting from their government. Any accounting of the costs of, of government spending is inherently incomplete unless it also includes data on the revenue loss to the government through tax breaks, incentives, and individuals and business and businesses received. Tax expenditures or tax breaks account for more than one trillion dollars in foregone revenue annually. While uh, they differ from uh, direct expenditures in form, they have the same net effect on the Federal budget. As such, efforts to improve the public's access and understanding of Federal spending information should also include the information on tax expenditures. I know the IRS already makes some data on tax expenditures publicly available in aggregate form, Mr. Chairman, but in Mr. Quigley's amendment, I would direct the new Board to conduct a study on the feasibility of drilling down even further. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I support the amendment. And again, I want to thank you for working with us on that. I want to thank you. The question now occurs on the amendment, uh, to the amendment in the form of substitute offered by the gentleman from Illinois. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Uh, is there, are there any other further amendments? Gentleman, uh, Mr. Welsh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate or er, read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2146, offered by Mr. Welch of Vermont. Page 4, insert after line 25 the following. 7, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act of 1977, the term Foreign Corrupt Practices Act of 1977. Ask unanimous consent to be considered as read. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this committee has done very good work on the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and trying to bring attention to where that is violated. And the purpose of this amendment is to suggest that the Board give high priority uh, to auditing and investigating or reviewing the Federal funds awarded to any contractor that has been found to be in violation of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act of 1977 and specifically to identify such a contractor as a violator of the Act, again, all in the spirit of, uh, I believe, uh, this uh, overall legislation to provide further transparency in an easily accessible way uh, to taxpayers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. Uh, if the gentleman is prepared to amend his amendment to include the language Ms. Spear had, uh, it is much of a technical amend amendment, so that it, it adds to the extent possible before the, or practical uh, before the Board shall give high priority. Good uh, idea. Okay. Without objection, that will be inserted as your amendment. Are there any other comments on the uh, gentleman's amendment? The gentleman from <coughs> Maryland is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, I want to uh, thank the Chairman for working with us on this amendment, and I want to thank Mr. Welch. Uh, for this very thoughtful am amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this, the, the whole issue, uh, this amendment requires the Board to give high priority to auditing, investigating, or reviewing Federal funds awarded to any contractor found to be in violation of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act of 1977. I believe this is a matter on which we all can agree it is consistent with the aims of the committee. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I would wholeheartedly support uh, Mr. Welch's amendment and urges adoption. And with that, I yield back. 
thank the gentleman. The question now, uh, uh, the question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by the gentleman from Vermont. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Are there any further amendments, Mr. Chairman? Uh, the gentleman from Maryland. Chairman, I have several amendments at the desk. I would ask unanimous consent that they be considered on block. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Uh, the, the, the clerk will begin reading the amendments. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2146 offered ask by Ask unanimous consent members. they be considered as read. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. As I indicated in my opening statement, I support efforts to establish an independent board to lead efforts to improve Federal spending transparency and accountability and believe these issues should uh, transcend partisanship. I am pleased to endorse the Data Act and appreciate the Chairman's willingness to include some of the changes requested by the minority in your manager's amendment. However, I continue to have additional concerns about what was not addressed in the amendment. As originally drafted, the Data Act provides the Chair of the FAST Board with the power to compel the testimony of any person in connection with any investigation or audit conducted by the Board. There is no court or grand jury supervision of the testimonial subpoena provision and no safeguards to protect the civil liberties of those compelled to provide testimony. As we heard from Chairman Devaney at the hearing last week on this bill, he believes this authority is unnecessary. The RAT Board had the authority to issue testimonial subpoenas in connection with stimulus oversight and did not encounter a single circumstance when such an exercise of compulsory process was needed. I believe additional safeguards are needed to help protect the rights and liberties of Americans. The Manager's Amendment takes a significant step in the right direction, and I am thankful that the Chairman, uh, the Chairman Issa recognized the need for an additional check on the process and, and required a vote of the Board prior to the issuance of a subpoena. One of my amendments would add additional safeguards to protect against abuses of process and ensure fairness and adequate process for any individual who receives a subpoena. I am also concerned about the process for selecting the chair for the new board. The bill requires the establishment of a commission that appears to be modeled on the current statutory appointment mechanism for the Comptroller General. Mr. Chairman, that process has resulted in lengthy vacancies, including the most recent vacancy of nearly three years from March 2008 to December 2010. I think the Chairman would agree with me that that is simply unacceptable. That is why another amendment I am offering strikes the provisions establishing a commission to make this election and maintains congressional input through an appointment by the President with the advice and consent of the Senate. I am also concerned about the virtually unprecedented authorities given the Board under the Data Act. As currently drafted, the Data Act grants the new Board uh, broad authority to conduct rulemakings, audit and investigate any and all Federal spending, issue subpoenas to compel testimony, and issue binding guidance to all Federal agencies and recipients of Federal funds. The Office of Management and Budget is the implementation and enforcement arm of the government-wide policy. In addition to budget development and execution, OMB manages agency performance, Federal procurement, financial management, and information policy and technology. It is in this capacity that OMB issued implementing guidance for the Recovery Act in February 2009 and updated guidance several times over the next year and a half to improve compliance, recipient reporting and data quality. It is clear from the success of the Recovery Act that this model worked. OMB has direct authority to issue guidance to agencies and recipients of Federal funds with the clarity of one voice and the tools to enforce that guidance. Therefore, another amendment I am offering follows the Recovery Act model by allowing the new Board to designate common data elements and data reporting standards, but directing, but directing OMB to work in consultation with the Board to issue implementing guidance. Mr. Chairman, I would rather, I'd rather, than, rather than having an extended debate on all of these issues today, I ask that you uh, commit to working with me to address these and some of my other concerns before moving the Data Act to the floor. I, I truly believe that the things that I am talking about here are things that uh, could, uh, would improve the bill, and I think they would go far towards the very ends that we are trying to get to. And would with that, the, would the gentleman yield? Of course. 
Uh, I completely agree that each of these are areas that we can work together on improvement. Certainly, we want to ensure that OMB has an active participation, along with a number of other agencies that have responsibilities for certain portions of the, of the guidance for regulations. And I believe we come to a common agreement uh, as to OMB's direct role. Uh, I also share with the member that we have got to get the subpoena authority right. It has to be limited. Uh, we believe for an agency that is going to be around for a very, very long time that giving them this authority is important, but as you said, it is likely not to be used, so we want to ensure that it would, if it was to be used, it would be only at the highest standard. And again, I believe we can get a further limitation uh, that is in the benefit of all. Uh, last, uh, on the Chairman's selection. Uh, I ha do have some concerns about the vacancies and the likelihood of vacancies. We modeled this after the GAO because we felt that this was to be a congressionally involved system. And to the extent that we can hybrid congressionally involved and presidential responsibility, I believe we can come up with a compromise on the chairman uh, selection. I look forward to working with the gentleman and agree to do so before it goes to the floor. With, with that, I mean, first of all, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that. And, and again, the intention is, is to make the bill uh, as effective and efficient as, as we possibly can make it and balance. And so with that, uh, with the Chairman's uh, statement, uh, I will show the amendment and yield back. The gentleman withdraws and yields back. Are there any further amendments? If there are no further discussion, the question is on the amendment in the nature of a substitute. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. In the opinion of the Chair, as the ayes have it, the amendment is agreed to. I now move to, uh, to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report. I now move that the Committee on o Oversight and Government Reform, Reform report H.R. 2146 to the House with the recommendation that that bill do pass as amended. The question is on favorably reporting House Resolution 2146 to the House. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify no. In the opinion of the Chair, as the ayes have it, the amendment is agreed to. And I don't have to roll the vote, so we will move to the next. I ask unanimous consent uh, that the staff be authorized to make necessary conforming and technical or changes to the bill, without objection, so ordered. The Committee will now consider H.R. 1974 the Access to Congressionally Mandated Reports Act. I will waive recognizing myself for the opening statement and recognize the author of the bill for, uh, for, to make the comment on behalf of the bill. Mr. Quigley. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, your support of this bill, the Access to Congressionally Mandated Reports Act, and for bringing it up for consideration today. I also want to thank all my colleagues on the committee, particularly the ranking member. Uh, Mr. Cummings and Representative Clay for co-sponsoring this bill with me. Uh, H.R. 1974 would simply make all agency reports to Congress that are releasable under FOIA available on one easy-to-use website at no cost to the public. Each year, Federal agencies submit thousands of reports to Congress containing a wealth of information that enable the public to better understand how well or not well Federal agencies are fulfilling their respective missions, from ensuring the safety of drugs and food supply, to protecting the environment, and monitoring the soundness of our financial institutions. Unfortunately, many of these reports simply sit collecting dust in the committees to which they are delivered, or are posted in numerous places or on dozens of agency websites rarely to be seen. The only comprehensive list of congressionally mandated reports is printed in paper format each year by the clerk of the House and is available only by request, provided that you know it exists. This is just one example of a very difficult to use and read report that we are talking about. My bill would, for the first time, create a single website where the public and members of Congress can easily search, sort and download all congressional reports from agencies. H.R. 1974 is intended to do two things. First, empower Congress. Every member of Congress and his or her staff will now be able to go to this website, type in the search word, and find all the reports from agencies related to that term. This will help us conduct better research and oversight of the agencies. Second, 
This bill will allow the public to learn about what agencies are doing and hold them accountable. The website will be hosted by the Government Printing Office, which fully supports the bill and is eager to get started on implementation. I have a letter of support for the bill from GPO expressing their willingness to implement its provisions, which I would like to submit for the record. The bill is also endorsed by 30 good government groups, pro-transparency groups, including but not limited to the Sunlight Foundation, Project on Government Oversight, OMB Watch, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, and the American Association of Law Libraries. We also worked closely with Chairman Issa's staff on the final language and incorporated all of their suggestions. This bill is meant to be a window into the workings of government and to ensure the government's business is done transparently and is accountable to the people it serves. I hope my colleagues will support this straightforward, common-sense bill and vote yes on H.R. 1974. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like to commend Representative Quickly for his work on the transparency issues for and for introducing uh, this bill. H.R. 1974, the Access to Congressionally Mandated Records Act, is a common sense measure that will make the government more transparent and accountable. H.R. 1974 will create a one stop shop where Congress and members of the public can access agency reports to Congress. Federal agencies are required to make thousands of reports to Congress each year. It, virtually, it is virtually impossible for Congress to keep up with all of these reports. Uh, this bill will improve congressional oversight by making it easy to find and access reports equally as important. This bill will give the public access to agency reports. Many reports are not currently available online. Even those reports that are available can be difficult to find. H.R. 1974 has been endorsed by 30 uh, organizations. A uh, similar bill was introduced by Rep uh, Representative uh, Steve uh, Dreyhaus in the last Congress, and it also received significant support uh, from the open government community. This is a good bill, and I urge members to support it. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Does any other member wish to speak on the bill? I uh, will move to strike the last uh, word myself briefly. Uh, I believe this is the kind of legislation we should work on regularly. Mr. Driehaus offered this in the last uh, Congress, and it was a good idea, but at that time it designated the Office of Management and Budget to, uh, to post these and to make the de determination about whether or not there was substantial compliance. Ultimately, under the separation of powers, I believe Mr. Quigley has recognized that if Congress asks for a uh, uh, report, Congress is the determinant about whether or not there has been substantial compliance. With that, Mr. Chairman, there is an amendment at the desk. Uh, with, well, yeah. With that, I will say, uh, I'm, I, I apologize. I should not have struck the last word, and I apologize. That was my opening statement instead. Uh, we, we, we will now open the bill, H.R. 1974, for consideration. Without objection, H.R. Uh, 1974 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed to each of you in your folders. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 1974, a bill to require the public printer to establish and maintain a website accessible to the public that allows the public to obtain electronic copies of all congressionally mandated. I ask unanimous consent to be considered as read. Does any member further wish to speak on the bill? If not, does any member wish to offer an amendment? The gentleman from Illinois is recognized for his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the or read the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 1974 offered by Mr. Quigley of <coughs> Illinois, page 6, line 17, insert, with the exception of technical changes after changed or removed. The gentleman is recognized to explain this very brief amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is a very simple technical correction that both the chairman and the ranking member support. The bill as written says that agencies can only change reports with the express written consent of the committees to which the reports were submitted. This amendment simply makes an exception for technical changes to a report. So if an agency notices a typo or math there, they don't have to go through the process of requesting permission from the committees to make the change. If any agency wishes to make substantive change to the report, they would still have to receive permission. The gentleman yields back. Thank you. The question is, on agreeing to the amendment offered by the gentleman from Illinois, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. 
Any opposed signify with no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Are there any further amendments? Hearing none, I move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report House Resolution 1974 to the House with the recommendation that that bill do pass as amended. The question is on, on favorably reporting H.R. 1974 to the House. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed signify by saying no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. <coughs> I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make necessary conforming and technical changes to the bill. Without objection, the motion and unanimous consent are agreed to. The committee will now consider H.R. 2061, the Civilian, uh, the Civil Service, uh, Civilian Service Recognition Act of 2011. Uh, I recognize myself for an opening statement. The Civilian Service Recognition Act of 2011 was introduced by Representative Hanna of New York and Representative Hinchy of New York earlier this month. The bill has 18 co-sponsors, including several members of this committee, uh, including the delegate from uh, Washington and uh, the gentleman from Virginia. The bill authorize, <coughs> authorizes a presentation of United States flag to family of Federal civilian employees who lose their lives while performing official duties, or because their status as a, or because of their status as a Federal uh, employee. My amendment makes a number of changes designate, designed to facilitate implementation of the legislation, including providing agency heads discretion in present, presentation ceremony, clarifying those eligible to request a flag, and requiring the agency head to consider the circumstances of the employee's death and nature of their service. I do support this bill once amendment, amended, and I would only close by commenting that uh, Brian Terry's family was presented flags by this committee uh, for just that reason. And uh, so I strongly support this bipartisan legislation and uh, yield back. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am glad our committee is considering constructive legislation pertaining to our dedicated Federal workforce, especially since they have received so much negative attention and criticism recently for simply doing their jobs. H.R. 2061. Uh, the Civilian Service Recognition Act seeks to ensure that Federal employees have access to a seemingly small yet very meaningful benefit that should have been provided long ago. H.R. 2061 would grant Department heads the authority to present the flag of the United States to, to Federal civilian employees who are killed either performing their duties or as a result of their status as U.S. Government employees. A Federal Government <coughs> The Federal Government employs over 2 million hardworking American, American citizens to commit themselves daily to public service. They are Federal law enforcement officers, emergency responders, engineers, scientists, and countless others who make enormous sacrifices uh, for our Nation. Many of these employees take on high risk and danger filled jobs, and they deserve our Nation's recognition and appreciation. For example, since 2001, over 35,000 Federal civilian employees have been deployed to Iraq, Afghanistan, and other combat-related zones in support of ongoing military missions, political and economic development efforts, and reconstruction projects. For these reasons, I enthusiastically support the underlying concept and the spirit behind H.R. 2061, and I urge all members to support the bill. I hope to work with the Chairman and other members on additional legislation to support Federal employees. One, exa one example. Uh, deployed Federal employees currently are not afforded the same level of treatment or access to certain benefits when injured on the job, whether here or abroad. In addition, uh, deployed Federal employees report inconsistencies in pay, leave, and work in, worker compensation benefits, as well as medical care upon their return. I hope we will be able to examine some of these issues as well. And with that, I fully support the bill, urge all members to support it. And I yield back. Thank you. I will hold the record open until the end of the day so that any member who would like to present a written statement may. 
We will now open the bill, H.R. 2061, for consideration. Without objection, H.R. 2061 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed to any. Is it each of your folders? The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 2061, a bill to authorize the presentation of the United States flag at the funeral of Federal civilian employees who are killed while performing official duties or because of their status as a Federal employee. I, have, I recognize myself. I have an amendment at the desk in the nature of a substitute. Uh, the amendment has been distributed without objection. The amendment will be considered as read and as the original text for purposes of amendment. Does any member uh, wish to speak on the bill? Seeing, okay, seeing none. Does any member wish to offer a further amendment? If there is no further discussion, the question is on the amendment in the nature of a substitute. All those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. I, I now move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 2061 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass as amended. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 2061 to the House. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The, uh, the motion is agreed to and ordered reported to the House of Representatives. I ask unanimous consent that the staff have be authorized to make all necessary and conforming technical changes to the bill without objection, so ordered. The committee will now consider the activities report for the first half of the first session of the 112th Congress, and I recognize myself uh, for an opening statement. On January 5th, the House of Representatives adopted rules for the 112th Congress to increase transparency and improve responsibility of the American people, to, to the American people. Today we will consider the first semi-annual activities report covering committee activities. <clears throat> From January through the end of May in past years, these reports have been filed once per Congress. Pursuant to House Rule 11, Clause 1D, the report must summarize the legislative and oversight activities of the uh, oversight and, and the oversight plan approved by the committee. Pursuant to uh, Rule 11, Clause 2, the report must include a separate listing of any hearings conducted on waste, fraud and abuse, or management of government programs that are in our jurisdiction. Interestingly, since they are all within our jurisdiction, it is by definition a broad report. It must also include recom rec uh, those recommended for review by agency inspector generals or included on the Government Accountability Office biannual high-risk list. Pursuant to HRS 72, the report must also summarize oversight or legislative activity conducted as part of or as a result of the <clears throat> inventory and review of existing, pending, and proposed regulations and orders. Finally, pursuant to House Rule 11, Clause 1D, we must file the, this report by June 30, 2011. Would Mr. Cummings uh, like to make an opening statement? The gentleman is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the activities report summarizes the hearings and business meetings the committee has held since the uh, start of the 112th Congress. I will not uh, object to the report uh, or offer amendments, but I would like to raise two very important points. First, this activities report is absolutely silent on the issue of the mortgage servicing companies who are currently refusing to provide documents relating to illegal foreclosures, inflated fees, and widespread fraud against the American homeowners and our constituents. I am particularly alarmed by the increasing report that the United States service members, our military, those people that we send off to battle, and their families have been illegally evicted from their homes and charged millions of dollars in unwarranted fees. We heard some of that testimony in Baltimore. As you know, members of our committee voted on February 10th to adopt our oversight plan for this Congress pursuant to House Rule 10, Clause 2D. The oversight plan states explicitly that the committee will, and I quote, examine the foreclosure crisis, including wrongful foreclosures 
and other abuses by mortgage servicing companies. That is what we all agreed to. But that is not happening. Several, several mortgage uh, servicing companies have now sent letters to the committee to both you and me stating that they will not, they will not, they will not provide documents unless you issue a subpoena. Here is a letter uh, from one company, MetLife, Inc., which explains that it will not provide documents unless, and I quote, quote uh, they are subject to subpoena, end of quote. Your staff has reached out to ask for additional information. So yesterday I sent you a, a detailed letter on this issue. It was my fourth letter over the past six months. I set forth in great detail the specific allegations of abuse committed by mortgage servicing companies and the specific steps I have taken to obtain the information voluntarily. I provided you with copies of the written correspondence from the mortgage servicing companies stating in clear terms that they will not provide necessary information unless they are compelled to do so. Sadly, on Saturday, we will, in my district in Baltimore, be holding our sixth foreclosure prevention conference where we will literally have more than 1,000 people in tears, uh, worried about mortgages and being foreclosed upon. Uh, and many of them will have been victims of abuse of some of these very same companies. Those are our constituents, and I am very saddened for them, but we will be able to do something about them in Baltimore. But the fact is, is that when you have mortgage companies and servicers basically saying, uh, we don't care, uh, you, you can't do anything anyway because you are not, we're not, we're just not going to give you uh, information that you requested, although we have already admitted to wrongdoing. These are people that have already admitted to it. Um, it, just, it just concerns me. Uh, I raise this issue because the foreclosure crisis is affecting millions of Americans across the country, including those in every district uh, represented uh, by members of this committee, the devastating communities and impairing our Nation's economic recovery. I do not want to offer pointless amendments to the activities you report. I want the documents, and so should this committee. My second point relates to jobs. The first line of the activities report claims that the, num quote, the number one priority of the Congress is to foster private sector job creation and get Americans back to work, end of quote. But it has now been 169 days, and the Republican leadership still refuses to bring a single jobs bill to the floor. Instead, the Republican leadership has insisted on pushing reckless cuts that destroy jobs, undermine our economic growth, and weaken our middle class. We are seeing, Mr. Chairman, one of the greatest transfers of wealth that has been experienced in my 60 years on this earth. In terms of our committee's jurisdiction, there have been 12 bills to date. Three have been enacted into law, one to extend the Ronald Reagan Centennial Commission, one to name a post office in California, and one relating to D.C. school vouchers. Five more have passed the House and all bills, uh, and, and all bills to name post offices. Four more have passed the committee, two relating to Federal employee taxes and probation periods, and two relating to contractor taxes and sunset dates for protesting tasks and delivery orders. Even if you include the legislation we are marking up today, which I support, none of these bills has anything to do with creating jobs. Over the next six months, I hope we can focus less on attacking the Federal workforce, attacking labor unions and attacking regulations that the oil industry and others want to repeal. Instead, I hope we can focus more on concrete solutions to help Americans with their jobs, their homes, their health and their education. Uh, we have a tremendous opportunity uh, on this committee. I think today's uh, uh, markup, Mr. Chairman, was a, a giant step in the right direction, and I look forward to working with you as we move forward. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I will hold the record open until the end of the day for any members who wish to submit a statement. We will now open the report for consideration. Without objection, the report will be considered as read and open for amendment at any Chairman. point. Mr. Chairman, uh, just one moment. The report has already been distributed to each of you in your folders. The clerk will designate the report. A report of the activities of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform for the first half of the first session of the 112th Congress. Does any member wish to speak on the report? The gentleman from Missouri is recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, um, just to echo what the, what the uh, um, ranking member stated, you know, the first sentence of this committee's 
first semiannual activities report is, and I quote, the number one priority of this Congress is to foster private sector job creation and get Americans back to work. As the majority has made this the very first sentence, I would have to conclude that they feel that this is the number one priority of this committee as well. However, as I read through the report and the listing of hearings and meetings held, all bills enacted into law, I find it difficult to see how fostering private sector job creation and getting Americans back to work is the number one priority of this committee. And I don't see that at all. I see a committee that is just about as committed to job growth as is the majority in the House as a whole, which is not very much at all. Looking through the activity report, I see a bill that extended the termination date for the Ronald Reagan Centennial Commission. I see a bill, an unconstitutional bill, that cynically took advantage of the possibility of a government shutdown and tried to change the way, we, the way laws are made. And I see a bill that tried to undermine public education in the District of Columbia. I also see a bill that tried to make it harder for new Federal workers to become members of the civil service. And in particularly ironic example, I see a bill allowing the government to fire, fire Federal employees who are late on their taxes. And I don't see how firing someone puts anyone back to work. It only adds to the unemployment rolls and it decreases tax revenues and it prevents the Federal employees from getting out from under that tax burden. And I don't see bills that put people back to work. I don't see bills that foster private job creation. And I don't see hearings and investigations that promote jobs. I do see hearings on the administration, on the administration's use of the regulatory process, the administration's response to the BP oil spill disaster the administration's compliance with the Freedom of Information Act and the administration's compliance with the Presidential Records Act. And I see a hearing on the so-called Obamacare program, a, a per, 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 pejorative term that is just red meat for red states, as are most, if not all, of this committee's hearings this year. And I do not see any hearing on actual job creation, and I do not see any hearing on any non-job issues that properly belong before this committee right now, such as the decennial census, and that is troubling. Uh, in 2007, when I became chairman of the Census Subcommittee, we discovered that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle had conducted only two oversight hearings in the, on the 2010 Census, two hearings in six years. As a result, there were numerous problems with the plans for the Census, problems that could have been and should have been discovered with proper oversight from the majority. Now, this was during a time that, as the Chairman eloquently pointed out during a hearing last week, the majority was inappropriately concerned with simply protecting the President and the Bush administration. And I am proud of the fact that when I was chairman, as a result of the more than 20 hearings we held and investigations we initiated, the 2010 Census was successful. We resolved the problem issues through proper oversight. And we did what we were supposed to do. We didn't take our eye off the ball in order to score cheap political points, and the record stands for itself. And we didn't deny the minority the right to select their own witnesses. We didn't exclude the minority from investigative trips, and we didn't disclose court-sealed documents, and we didn't issue unilateral subpoenas. We didn't violate House rule, ethics rules to stream video at our field hearings. And as for this first semi-annual activities report, I would suggest that we change the first sentence, because it does not accurately reflect the conduct of this committee over the last five months. I yield back. I recognize myself. There are so many didn'ts 
that I wonder if you were on this committee in the last Congress, because those I've didn't. I've been on this committee those didn't, for 10 The gentleman is not recognized. Those didn't yeah, well. did happen. But having said that, I would like to comment on the fact of the report. First of all, I think we should, on a bipartisan basis, be proud that we have done a great deal of oversight. I think we should be perhaps proud that we have done less post offices and less centennial reauthorizations and less of a great deal that on bo under both Republicans and Democrats this committee had begun to consider as important legislation. I do believe that we will look at uh, a once every 10-year event regularly throughout the next 10 years. But I would be remiss if I made uh, a great deal of gloating over something that just finished that has 10 years to go before it happens again. Uh, I believe the gentleman might well be talking about the wasteful time on that sense is had we spent a great deal of time on it in the first six months of this Congress. I would like to reflect on behalf of, uh, of both Republicans and Democrats for a moment. This committee is made up of people with two eyes and two ears. And on each side, we seem to see the same thing with both of our eyes and hear the same thing with both of our ears. We go to the other side, we hear something different, we see something different. That will be the challenge of this committee now and in the future. I believe we can do better in the next six months than we did in the first six, partially because we have overcome a lot of that talking past each other, a lot but not all of the seeing only what we want to see. There are a lot of challenges that face America. People are still not getting the jobs that they are used to getting coming out of a recession. They are not, not seeing the bounce back either in the mortgage market availability or in the, uh, uh, the value of their homes. There are plenty of problems in America that we must see with the same eyes, hear with the same ears, and I believe we can get there. This report is not intended to gloat over what we did for the six months. It is intended to accurately report what we did and leave out what we didn't do. During the first six months, we did have a hearing in Baltimore on the request of the ranking member, and it was a good hearing and it was well attended. During the first six months, we did have oversight on regulatory impediments to job creation, and I believe we have come a long way. We have had controversial hearings, hearings that we believe differently about whether or not impediments to job creation or, in fact, the conduct of this administration is working toward job creation positively or not. We will continue to do that. I pledge to work with the ranking member to make sure that six months from now, when the next report comes out, we will have done more items which are meaningful to the minority and meaningful to the majority. That is a responsibility and a promise I make here. But we have to do it together. We will have hearings that we disagree on. We will have ideological differences on whether or not, as the gentleman from Missouri said, that laying off people who or dismissing people who haven't paid their taxes is, in fact, a, quote, increasing unemployment and losing tax revenue or a measured response to individuals who were reckless and irresponsible. When we had those hearings, I remember distinctly there was very little sympathy for the uh, contractor who do did it, who then would lay off his employees, but more sympathy for the Federal employer. I plan to introduce legislation that tries to bridge that difference, that tries to come up with a narrow uh, bill that will both sides can endorse. It, the the uh, legislation that left here earlier I do not believe is likely to become law. This committee has two responsibilities. Further the knowledge of all of Congress in, in the performance of their duty and offer legislation for real reform that ultimately is viable enough to become law. We should not be the committee of making statements that are not supported or offering legislation that is dead on arrival. Would the I, chairman yield? I will in just a moment, and I will endeavor to do that. This today should have been an opportunity for us all, and I hope it will be in any further opening comments, that it, this will be an opportunity for us to say, as the ranking member often says, we are better than this. We can do better. This is our watch. It is our time, and we have to do more. I am a brand new chairman. This is a brand new majority. We didn't do as well as we could have. 
we want to do better, I reach out to you and ask you, please help us do better, but also realize that it's, it's our turn to lead and we have to do the best we can. So it is what you can find that we can agree to, that we can work on, that is most important, not the eyes that will never see things the same. I yield to the gentleman. Thank you for yielding, Mr. Chairman. And I, I look forward to working with you and other members on this committee. We are the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. And if, if we talk about what we have done in the first six months, you know, we have done, um, this committee has acted on 64 bills and resolutions. Twenty-two of those were later enacted into law and 15 were passed by the House. These figures include 25 re resolutions and 19 postal namings. And so, I mean, look, we did a lot of that in the previous Congress also. And really, we need to get back to the objective of how do we save taxpayer money? How do we have true oversight and transparency over our government? And so if, if, if you want to engage us in that, I am willing to work with anybody over there. Reclaiming my time, I appreciate that. Uh, as to the ranking member's statement about uh, the mortgage, continued mortgage crisis, uh, I have been informed by staff that our letter should be returning to the ranking member, uh, delineating one of the reasons that we have not yet issued those subpoenas, although the threat is out there, and also the other agencies that we are working with who are compelling information. Uh, I look forward to an extended meeting with the ranking member and his staff so that we can plan out how we are going to get the legitimate discovery that we need. Uh, and with that, I thank you Does it, and yield back. Does anyone else wish to uh, speak? The gentleman from Pennsylvania. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, having been a new member and only sitting here for a little bit over five months, I feel I am almost compelled to make some statements. And there is an old saying out there that says, this, of, all the, of all the words that men have penned, the saddest are what could have been. And I would tell you that when you sit in this chamber and when you sit in these committees, I don't sit here as a Republican or as a Democrat. I sit here as an American. And I got to tell you, from being in the private sector my whole life and understanding the unintended consequences of legislation that is put into the private sector, and when we talk about creating jobs, jobs will be created in the private sector. And the only way that revenue will rise in this country is when businesses become successful and profitable and we are able to hire people again. The fact that we can play this ping pong game back and forth, pointing a finger at who didn't do what at what time, gentlemen, this is not optional. This has happened on our watch and it must be done. The first six months, I am very happy with what we have done the first six months. If nothing else, we have shed a spotlight on how difficult, how difficult government makes it for us in the private sector to possibly succeed. And having done it my whole life, I have got to tell you, not only is it disappointing, but it is also now very, it is it's so obvious to me that only, only in this beltway do we not understand how business truly works. This is not a political statement. This is a statement of survival. And if we cannot agree as Americans that we have to get this fixed, and if we do make it a political ping pong match and ideologically disagree on different things that don't fix anything other than maybe make a political statement for the strategy of 2012's reelection. I have got to tell you, I am getting to the point where it should come down to what if. What if we didn't have to worry about being reelected? What the heck would we get done in this chamber? What would we accomplish in this chamber? What would we do for the American people in this chamber? It is absolutely no wonder to me why our approval rating is where it is. We do a lousy job of representing the American people. We may feel we have done a good job for our party. We have done a lousy job for the people that we represent. Mr. Chairman, I am very gra grateful to be able to serve in this committee and to shed a spotlight on this, having worked under these onerous conditions for so many years and understanding that there were, more, there were more regulations put on me in the automobile sector to change five quarts of oil in my shop than there was on BP to sink a hole in the Gulf. If we don't start to understand what it is that we are doing to the people who run this country, who make this country great, we have really wasted our time. So I would say this, and I say it strictly as an American. Gentlemen, this is not optional. 
This is our time. It happened on our watch, and it has to be fixed now. We are truly past the midnight hour. We are in denial. This country will not right itself if we don't straighten this out in Washington, D.C. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time, and I thank you for your efforts and for the job that you are doing. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. If there is no further discussion, Mr. Chairman, the Chairman, ranking no. member. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will be very brief. Mr. Chairman, I want to, first of all, thank you uh, and all the members for the comments. Um, you know, as I listen, I, I want to there are always different ways to look at things, Mr. Chairman. We can, like you said, we all have two eyes and two ears. And, and we all, I think sometimes we forget that we all come to this place with different experiences. And, you know, the experience that I, I have is that when I walk out of my house that is located in the inner, 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 inner city of Baltimore, I am usually greeted in the morning by four or five people who say something like, I need a job. That is what I am greeted with. When I go to the gas station, Cummins, you know, I am glad to see you at the station, man, but maybe you can fill up your car, but I can't fill out mine. Greeted with looking literally, literally across the street from my house and seeing out of maybe 15 houses, five of them in foreclosure. That is what I see every day. And all of us bring different things to the table. And, I'm, and, I, and I take the chairman at his word and I'm, and I'm, that, that, we can, that we can do better. All of us can do better. And you are right. You are absolutely right. And I think that when we look at the phenomenal potential that we have in this committee to touch people's lives and that the, our jurisdiction is just so awesome, when I think about this blessing that we have to, to actually make a difference, and, and then I think about my constituents, who, who many of whom don't have a way of making changes, don't have a way of fighting back, don't have a way of changing anything, but has left it up to us. And so I'm, I, uh, I take the chairman at his word, I, and I'm, and I'm hoping. And like I said, and I meant it. I was so um, pleased that we were able to to take the legislation that we passed the other day. And I think this is a this today today was an example of what we can accomplish when we do work together. And so, Mr. Chairman, I am looking forward to the next six-month report. And I think that we have you know, now laid a foundation and hope we can, hopefully we can build on that. With regard to the subpoenas, Mr. Chairman, I, I guess what bothers me about that is that I, it's, it's, I just don't like the idea of the banks acting as if you know, we don't matter. When we ask questions and they say, okay, MetLife says, you know, uh, and I get the feeling that and they're not saying it like this, but you're not going to get a subpoena anyway. So you know, the hell with you. And that's how I feel. And I just I don't want. And I and, and I think you know this. And I've said it many times. If 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 there is an agency, or a, or a bank, anybody who says that to you, I'm going to be 100 percent with you on that subpoena because that that abuses the process of what we are trying to do. That goes against what we're, we as a committee are trying to do. And I just feel that that is what they, these, these folks are trying to do to us. We are just trying to get to the bottom line. I'm just, I, just, I mean, when I have got people who have admitted that they have basically railroaded my constituents, I mean, I, I, I got to do something. And I go back to what you said. Uh, we just, we, 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 I think we, we, we we're in a position that sometimes I, we forget uh, how how powerful we are and how much we can do. And then the other thing is that you know, like we can wait, spend a lot of time. We can waste the time. I, and I've I've told you, Mr. Chairman, many. I mean, I've said it in this this committee that you know we want to be effective and efficient. That's what this is all about. And we can walk out of here and say, at the end of say six months, we were able to achieve that dot dot for the American people. I think that that that's the most important thing. The rhetoric is nice, talk is nice. The question is, what do we achieve? And I, and I believe that we now have laid a foundation that we can achieve a lot. And with that, I will yield back. I thank the gentleman. If there is no further discussion, I move the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform approve the activities report for the first half of the first session of the 112th Congress. The question is on reporting the activities report for the first half of the first session of the 112th Congress to the House. All those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed signify by saying no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The no motion is agreed to.
The committee will now consider the, the following bills, H.R. 789, H.R. 1843, H.R. 1975, H.R. 2062, H.R. 2149, H.R. 2213, and H.R. 2244 in block. Uh, and I have already previously delineated these, and uh, I certainly support them. I will note that these are postal namings, and that postal namings fall through this committee. And I join with the, the, the ranking member and the gentleman from Missouri. We do not and should not be scoring postal namings as bills accomplished. And I would note that the activities report does not highlight them. And with that, I recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Thanks, Chris. Oh, my goodness, I have the right ranking member, too. I didn't see you guys switch. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for moving these bills so swiftly through T the Tell process. me how much you really support them and, and how really important they are now. I yield back. Thank you. I will hold the record open until the end of the day for members who would like to submit their written statements. I ask unanimous consent that the committee favorably report H.R. 789, H.R. 1843, H.R. 1975, H.R. 2062, H.R. 2213, H.R. 2149, and H.R. 2244. Without objection, so ordered. The committee stands adjourned.